Hello everyone, welcome back to another review of The Bad Batch. Today we're taking a look at episodes 7 and 8 of season 2, The Clone Conspiracy and Truth and Consequences. So, uh, this is a two-parter that thankfully they released uh, on the same day, which is very nice. Uh, this would have been one of those, you know, way back in the day, annoying moments where you're sitting there watching Cartoon Network, and then they have this obvious cliffhanger, and then the clone, and then it's like, you're like, oh, what's going to happen next? And then, and you're like, ah, you got, you got to wait a week. Can't believe it. Should have seen that coming. <laughs> So it, it's nice that they did uh, put these up back to back, so that way we could we could see uh, everything, you know, the, the whole story play out, and we didn't have to really wait. So that was appreciated, and this is a really really good little two parter here. Um, so just looking at the broad picture, I've you know said it before because it's in the first reviews for the first two episodes of this season and everything, and it's just. I, I can't really keep bringing it up because it just continues to be true. But this show just does a really good job at being more Clone Wars, you know, being a continuation of Clone Wars. And normally I would say I'd probably just leave it at that. But I think, especially after last week's episodes or episode, um, I, I think I need to go a little more in depth with that because it's doing a good job of still being Clone Wars in more ways than one. Because um, the week before last, we had the Indiana Jones-type episode with the Zepho robot or whatever it was supposed to be. Then we had the Gunji episode, and that one I was a little mixed on because it just felt a little half-baked. And then we had these episodes. And I find it interesting because... I saw a comment somewhere from a reviewer somewhere that um, was talking about these two episodes, the clone conspiracy episodes, saying that The Bad Batch is an amazing show when it chooses to be. And I kind of take exception with that statement. Because while I agree, you know, based on my review from last week, yeah, yeah the, the tri tribe was a little bit half-baked. I would have liked for them to dig into some of those ideas and themes that they were exploring in that episode more for, or for it to be longer or two episodes or whatever. While it was a little bit of a letdown compared to some of the other episodes, um, I do feel that the Bad Batch is doing a really good job at still being Clone Wars in both the thematic elements that it's continuing forward, but at the same time also the type of ep type of episodes that they're carrying forward because by the end of the series we'd kind of become adjusted to four three to four episode arcs that was how the show worked is you'd get your three or four episodes and then you'd move on to the next one season four pretty much worked that way with few exceptions season five definitely worked that way um season six worked that way and season seven worked that way. That's you know that's how it was. So that's four of your seven seasons mostly working that way, and th and that was awesome because it, it allowed for a lot of really really awesome episode arcs where we got these longer stories told over you know a three or four week span, like Ventress and the Night Sisters, or in, in which eventually led to Maul coming back, which is amazing. Or of course Umbara, you know Umbara is like the big standout arc from season four. Um, or, you know, ah Ahsoka's trials on, on Coruscant being framed and all that from season five. And then, of course, the Siege of Mandalore. Uh, you know, all, all those are really great episodes and, you know, story arcs and all that. But we, we got so accustomed to that that something that people forget is that the first two, three seasons of Clone Wars really were more adventure of the week type episodes. And occasionally you'd get you know, uh, a three or four episode arc thrown in there. Like uh, the season, the series opened up with an adventure of the week episode and then immediately pivoted into having the three episode arc with the malevolent story. Then, you know, it kind of went and kind of did kind of its own little thing again. And then he's like, oh, you got, you got a, you got a two party here with the droids and R2 gone missing and all of that. But then now we're right back to kind of, we're, uh, you know, rookies and here in, 
and then here's kind of this random side adventure over here and over there. And, oh, here's a two-part thing about the Blue Shadow virus. And then season two had, you know, oh, here's some stuff with bounty hunters. Here's three episodes with bounty hunters. But then... But then you've got... There was other stuff going on. So it's like Adventure of the Week stuff was really mostly kind of how Clone Wars operated in its early days. Um, and the, the, I, and the idea of, and then as they got continued working, they really realized that, you know, we can tell these longer form stories and really do something special with them. And that's what they ended up pivoting to. But even then the more adventure of the week centered episodes, I don't think were bad. A lot of people like to look at season one and go, I ah, can just skip over it which I take great offense to because I think for the most part, season one is a really, really solid show, even if by t- by the standards, especially now with the way The Bad Batch looks, season one of Clone Wars is sure a little dated, but it's still a really good season of TV. I mean, yeah, there's a couple of Jar Jar episodes in there, but the Jar Jar episodes aren't like horrendous i feel like there's a little something in there for even the the older the older people watching you know to get something out of like uh the gungan general has padme at least you know being her typical sly self and escaping battle droids on her own without needing any help and then of course that led into two other episodes about chasing down gun ray and, and led to darker material like like Captain Argaius getting stabbed through the chest because Ventress didn't want to share credit for Gunray's rescue. And then, of course, Lair of Grievous, which just had a, a, giant, a really big body count. Like, almost every character introduced in that episode. Uh, that was... Actually, no, no, no. Every character that was introduced in that episode that was new and not a prior established character, like Grievous, Kit Fisto, or... Um, Yeah, basically just them. You know, everyone else died. All the clones died. N- Nadar Veb died. Uh, the doctor, you know, the Grievous' little doctor droid died. Of course, you know, him being a droid, he could just be put back together. Um, Gore, the scary creature in the basement, died. You know, it's like <laughs> that episode has a body count where almost every character we see dies. So, I mean, that's, that's you know, that's a little darker. But, oh, it's a cartoon, so it's, it's fine. Um, so, it's, so, I really... And, you know, it's like you want to look at Lair Grievous and go, that's a bad episode. I think I think that's a really thrilling, exciting episode. And it's like and that's probably not one people would point to and say that's a bad episode. Sure. But I, I think I think season one for Clone Wars is a strong start for the series. And it only went up from there. You know, season two, we got larger battles. Of course, season one ended with the introduction of Cad Bane, and before that, the uh, the Ryloth three-parter, which had a lot of really cool big action scenes. And then season two went bigger with Geonosis, um, and then you got some other darker stuff thrown uh, thrown in here, there. Of course, Boba Fett coming back in the young Boba Fett being there at the end of season two, having some loose ends from Attack of the Clones tied up and everything. We got to see Bosk. Uh, Commander Pond's just getting straight up executed and launched at the airlock. Harrowing as a child. Because, you know, you, <laughs> I remember it's like, oh, Com- Commander Pond's, he's, he's, you know, he's Windu's clone commander. He seems like a cool guy. And then, oh, he's dead. <laughs> it was one of those early, kind of early clone deaths where it's like, you know, even recurring characters that, um, <coughs> excuse me, even recurring characters that had been around for a little while could easily get killed off. And it was kind of a, a warning sign of things to come because, you know, you'd had the one-off episode you know, episode characters that would get killed off pretty easily, like Ganact or Captain Argaius, as I brought up earlier. But Commander Pons had been around for several episodes, and so it's him just being, you know, tossed aside and killed off so easily like that was, you know, a sign of things to come, really. It's like, you know, oh, here's Duchess Teen. She's going to be around for a while, and, you know, nothing tragic could happen here. <laughs> so I always take offense to this idea that, you know, season one of Clone Wars was bad, and then getting back on, on topic here, that the Bad Batch can be an amazing show when it wants to be. It's like, I think it is an amazing show. It's like, yeah, not every episode is directly dealing with these gigantic bombshells. You know, sometimes it's fun to just do a racing episode where it's like, oh, let's take care of some bugs that are <laughs> that are living underneath um, 
the station or, or whatever, like in season one. So, I mean, yeah, you do have these random adventure of the week episodes, but I don't really think any of these are straight up filler. There's always a little bit of something going on there. Um, and I think, you know, people just don't really, if it's not going anywhere, then I think that's going to be incredibly strange, but I think it's pretty obvious they are going somewhere with it. And some of these episodes are going to help reinforce like, Sid's connection with Omega and make her guilty about betraying the Batch or something, which she may eventually do. Who knows? It's like, we'll, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get there and see how that plays out. Um, but, you know, kind of these more, quote-unquote, mundane Adventure of the Week episodes, I think, are serving their purpose because I think maybe the Bad Batch think that their mundane Adventure of the Week episodes... Wrecker says in this episode... Um, that, oh, he's tired of waiting on Sid to give them a mission. So the fact that, you know, one's come to them, he's, you know, they seem to be okay with, you know, jumping and jumping right into it and helping Rex out. So, I, so yeah, these episodes are, these two episodes are really, really good. But, and they are better than the last couple episodes we've received. However, I don't think that just because these are dealing with really heavy issues or topics doesn't mean that that's what inherently makes them better than the more mundane Adventure of the Week episodes. Now, these two episodes are certainly better than the last the last one, than Tribe, but of course that's that has nothing really to do about the subject matter of the story itself. It's that these episodes had time to, to actually breathe and tell their full story where Tribe, I felt, really didn't. So, and, and maybe some people could say the same about, like, the racing episode, but... I don't know, I felt that was like a fun 22-minute adventure, open, close, shut, you know, it's like it was teeing up some things that could come back later, so, so yeah, I'm, I, so that's kind of my long-winded, yeah, I'm fine with the Adventure of the Week episodes, sorry you've had to wait 12 minutes to, <laughs> to really get into the meat and potatoes of these episodes and what I'm going to talk about, which I don't really have too much to say, because, you know, they're solid, they're good, it's just going to be kind of praising everything, because I don't think there's excuse me, anything really wrong with these episodes. Um, yeah, so um, starting off, we have something that Clone Wars did well, and you know, it took a while to, for people to get adjusted because I feel like, you know, whenever Star Wars goes into politics, and it's like, oh, and especially the prequels, and it's like, all right, oh boy, here we go, here comes the sin, and it's so boring. It's like, especially with the way it was done here in The Bad Batch, I feel like some of the Senate stuff is, like, really thrilling and really fascinating. Not thrilling in the same way that, you know, it's like, ooh, it's an action scene. But, you know, it's it's interesting to hear them talking about clones. And it's and the, and even, even for Bail Organa to be, it's like, hey, we don't, him just not wanting a larger military. And then the other, and it's like, and I had to boo out loud because one of the senators in this meeting is of the Commerce Guild. I think it's the little wrinkly green lady. And, of course, she was one of the members present in Attack of the Clones for Dooku's little cabal meeting. So she is a straight-up separatist sympathizer. But like a lot of those organizations and guilds and, you know, the the corporations and such, you know, they kind of get a pass because, you know, oh, it was just business to them even though Dooku manipulated them to to help aid his, in the creation of his new droid army and all that. So um, so it is interesting that even after all that senator helped her corporation do to further the war as per Palpatine's plan, of course. Not that anyone else really knows that except him. But, yeah, but the fact that she's just allowed to continue in the Senate and not even be replaced, let alone the corporation dismantled. You would have thought that that would have been a major, you know, a major thing. Or it's like, okay, anyone that was aligned with the Separatists, they're gone, they're done. Especially since they keep talking about all these insurgents and, in like, the outer and mid-rims and stuff. So I had to boo when she showed up. But but I really liked the reintroduction of Rio Chuchi because she, we saw her a couple times throughout the first couple seasons, and then season three, I'm pretty sure, was her last appearance. Um, I think the episode of Sphere of Influence, where she was uh, kind of the main star of it alongside the Papanoida family. Um, Jennifer Hale, I believe, is her voice actress, so it's cool to have her back in Star Wars. She's done a lot of Star Wars stuff in the past. But um, this is maybe, I think, one of my favorite characters of hers, specifically in the Star Wars realm, because it's clear that Chuchi is one of the good guys as that 
clone officer um, slip says. And it's like, oh, I believe you're one of the good ones. And, and she is. She really is. You know, um, we first meet her in Trespass Season 1, which is, again, an Adventure of the Week episode, but it is a really strong episode. Uh, ta- you know, it's like <laughs> talking about, like, colonialism and, and you know, sovereignty amongst... Uh, yeah, it's like, you know, who, who owns this? And it's like, d- does Pantora have claim over this land? But there's people that were already living here. So, it, and, and I mean, this is, I mean, this is a lot of really sticky real world stuff. And we're doing it in a 22 minute Star Wars shoot 'em up show. It's, I mean, that's, I, that's, it was, I think, I think that's a really strong episode. And, uh, and it seems like she's a little timid at first, but then that's a good experience for her to really, to really kind of grow, you know, fill her, fill her shoes of her position. And, and we see her be a little more assertive in the episode she's in following. Like sometimes she's just in the background. She doesn't really have a speaking role and she's just placing a vote. But then in like sphere of influence, she is way, I mean, it's, she's a definitely, you know, more mature character than we saw her in trespass. And she's, she even bribes the trade or not bribes, blackmails the trade federation. (laughs) <laughs> with with all the goings on and stuff, and he's like black man. And she goes no business, and it's so so good. It's like to play their own cards against them. That was so well played from Chuchi, um, <laughs> and then gets a full apology from Lock Dodd in the Senate about what happened to Pantora. So um, having her show up was a really welcome sight. Um, I know I know online she is kind of a, a a cult fan hit fan favorite. There's a lot of people that like her, uh, myself included. It's like, oh yeah, this is a good character. I'm glad she's, I'm glad she's back. So, uh, really enjoyed that these episodes kind of focus on her and her kind of picking up the mantle from Padme because Padme really did kind of get this idea in the Senate rolling about clones, not as property, but as people. She didn't directly do it, but, you know, in that, when they were ta- doing, talking about the Military Creation Act and all that stuff that was talked about, back, Attack of the Clones, and then a couple of Clone Wars and everything, they're like, oh, do we order more cr- clone troopers or not? And she actually, through her impassioned speech about not trying to prolong the war and reaching out in all the branch of the Separatists and, and all that stuff, it's fu- so funny how, how take action Padme is, and she's not afraid to pick up a blaster and get into the thick of things and, you know, and go through some aggressive negotiations. But at the same time, like, every move she made in the Senate was for peace. She really was one of the good ones and was really trying to keep the peace. It's like, you know, she, because, and it's understandable because at such a young age, her planet was afflicted by war, and she had to take a leading part in that. And that was probably very, you know, if not traumatizing, then, of course, very informative on how she would grow grow up through the rest of her term as Queen of Naboo. So, of course, you know, when the Clone Wars break out, yeah, she's not afraid to go on these missions, get her hands dirty, and blast some battle droids. But, like, every move she makes is trying to keep the peace and bring an end to the war. And not even through violent means. She even jumps through, jumps into enemy territory and conspires with an enemy senator from the other side to try to get a peace treaty on the table. And, of course, Dooku and Palpatine put a stop to that through their own, you know, backhanded ways. But, um, you know, that one time she delayed the vote, she did kind of start bringing up the question of, are these clones property? Are they individual men? You know, it's like, it, again, it wasn't directly there, but it was in the subtext of, <laughs> of um, hold on, and and it's so funny mentioning the Bad Batch is that it clearly left an impact on clones because in that deleted scene from the from the early animatics of the of the original version of those Bad Batch episodes from what would have been I think season eight at the time before um, things before the show was canceled and things got reshuffled around for the eventual what ended up being season seven there is that deleted scene of course where many of you are probably aware where they're going to board the ship and on the Marauder there is this pinup art of Padme on the side and Anakin is like what the heck is that he is not happy and Hunter's like oh yeah that's the Naboo Senator we watch her on the hollow scans. And of course, Record's like, she can negotiate with me anytime. Ah, and laughing. <laughs> About a very, very adult joke for, for Star Wars, especially animated Star Wars, but uh, very risque. Um, so clearly, you know, even though that was deleted and removed for what is a much better scene with Anakin talking to Padme in the final version 
um, it clearly left an impact on clones. And so for Chuchi to be taking up that mantle now, I, I really, really like. And I hope we see more of her, and this isn't it. And, like, in three episodes' time, we don't see a thing on the Hollow News about, you know, her meaning of bad accident because she because the power converters and her speeder failed or something and she plummeted to her doom. I really hope we don't see that. Um, so, because at this at this point... Yeah, there's probably some senators that aren't quite sure where the empire is going, but there's got to be some optimism. Well, at least the war is over. A big centralized government in this time of crisis maybe still can be helpful, and they don't really know, you know, exa- you know they don't know Palpatine's evil. You know, that's not completely apparent yet. Um, it is to us, the audience, because we know. But, you know, but this is probably when the first alarm bells start going off of Palpatine. It, I love how they set this up, because in the first episode... Or Bail Organa says, it's like, and what does the Emperor think of this? Like, why isn't he here? I think Bail is already suspicious, and, you know, he is thinking about rebellion type things already, because he, because, I mean, this is one of the things that he and Padme were trying to stop in those deleted scenes from Revenge of the Sith, and it ended up happening anyway, much to his terror and horror. Um, so he does point out that, hey, the Emperor hasn't been around long in, in, a, in a while. It's like, is he actually going to participate in these things like he should be, like when he was Chancellor? And then, of course, by the end of the next episode, here he comes rising up out of the dais and <laughs> talking about, you know, it's like it's time to usher in the era of the Imperial Stormtrooper. It's just in that so cool Ian McDermott, scary, evil voice that is just so iconic and it's just and it's just he just gives that one little speech that's all that's all they got him for i mean i don't know he may appear later in the season um but you know for that episode that is all he just he just and it is cool to see how it sound it so when he starts off it does sound kind of like just a darker you know chancellor palpatine you know, it's like my thanks to Senator Chuchi for uncovering the traitor I missed, or whatever. But then, as he keeps going, it does dip way more into that Darth Sidious. You know, the Emperor. You know, he is the ultimate evil in the galaxy. And when he finishes with Imperial Stormtrooper, it's like really chewing that scenery. It's like, ah. Oh. Man, he is just so cool sounding. It's just so it's just so great. It's just so awesome. Really, really love that. Um So yeah, um Echo going with Rex is not necessarily something I saw coming. Um and that's maybe a nitpick for the episode, is I don't know if that was really set up that well. Um it's kinda it kinda comes out of nowhere. They don't really there's not really a moment where he and Rex have a conversation. And Echo decides to leave. It it really does come and come out of nowhere, and that may have been the intention. Um, so and so, yeah. I don't know if we're gonna get Rex and Echo episodes going forward, where it's like you know we'll get a batch, we'll get another batch, and then it's like ah Rex and Echo, and then two more batches, and then ah Rex and Echo, and then that leads into the season finale or something. Um, so yeah, I I don't know. Uh, what they're going to do with that, but it'll be interesting. Um, it was very satisfying seeing Rampart getting arrested by clones, <laughs> specifically clones, you know, having the shock troopers, you know, it's like, like they didn't even wait for him to, you know, to bring the thing back. You know, they just got on their little, in the little air scooter things and just went over there and got him. That was so great. It's like, yeah, get him. And it's, you know, so funny about the, you know, you hear the, kind of sometimes the excuse of, oh, they were just, you know, they're just following orders. And yeah, and that's the excuse he's trying to trying to use. It's like I'm I was just following orders, and it's like, well, you know, you're you are your own person, and you made the wrong decision to do something that was morally wrong. And it's like you destroyed a planet. So yeah, um, so yeah, it, it it was great seeing Rampart go down. I wonder if we'll see him at all after this, or if they're just gonna again thing on the Hollow News he was executed or something like that. Um, I, I could totally see him popping up again, um, like crosshair trying to, you know, trying to desert, and then like he breaks Rampart out to use him as leverage or something to help him get away, you know, since they've got so much, you know, history between the two of them now, it would be kind of weird to have crosshair and not have Rampart be a part of that episode, maybe, um, but I don't know, it's, I mean, the fact that we've only seen crosshair in one episode so far is a little, a little strange, but, you know, they're, I mean, it's been a busy season so far, really. So, um, 
Yeah, uh, Trace and Rafa's garage was there, but just their garage. <laughs> Trace and Rafa themselves, the girls did not show up. Much to, I'm sure, a lot of people's, uh, you know, <laughs> sigh of relief. Um, I don't mind Trace and Rafa, they're fine. But, um, you know, their garage showed back up. It was an, it was an easy reuse of assets location. Um, I don't know if I really have too much else to say. Uh, I mean, like, I mean, they're just really good episodes. The continued plot thread of this show, yeah, it's about the Bad Batch, but more than that, it's about the Bad Batch in this changing galaxy and how the changing galaxy is affecting all of clone kind. That's just that's just really cool. I I can't believe that we are living in an era of Star Wars where that is the main theme of an entire show. That's just because back in the day when Clone Wars was actually still on the air and everything, you know, that that I you know, a lot of these a lot of these topics were only being talked about in in the books, the books that ended up, of course, getting decanonized and don't count anymore. So, like, so like digging into this stuff in the Republic Commando novels back in the day was really fascinating and interesting to think about. And now here we are doing, you know, it's like going into it for, quote-unquote, for real this time, like as if the last time wasn't for real, and then they just tossed all that out the window. Um, so this time it really is for real, and it, it's definitely going to be for real because there's no way that after they... Because a book has to be much less of a monetary investment than an entire TV show with an animation team and scripts written and voice actors and hired and all that. I mean, for Pete's sake, the hi- they hired Ian McDermott to give one short little speech for this for these episodes. Um, so, I mean, that's got to, yeah, that definitely counts as this is not going to get removed from canon. Uh, this is here to stay. So the fact that this show is dealing with this as its main thesis is this main idea of what happens to clones after the war. Uh, that's just really cool. I really like that. Um, and so, yeah, and that's one of the reasons why even when we do get Adventure of the Week episodes, I'm still hooked into hooked into the show and i'm very eager to see where it goes so yeah um i think that'll pretty much be it because like you know it's just really all good stuff here there's not really too much to nitpick it's just you know talk about the the big details and how interesting it is and stuff so so yeah that'll be it for this review uh let's see here next week's episode is another one-off and it is i had this pulled up a second ago and it went away here we go it is the crossing so it's interesting because the last couple episodes, I've had an idea of where we were going. It's like, Solitary Clone, okay, that's got to be the Cody episode. Faster, up, oh, that's got to be the racing episode from the trailer. Entombed, up, oh, here's our adventure episode with probably the big walking thingy. Tribe, probably something to do with Wookiees. Uh, clone Conspiracy, Truth and Consequences, obviously has something to do with clones. And But now we get to The Crossing, and it's like... What the heck is that about? Honestly, like all the rest of the season, I have no idea what it's what it's about. The crossing that could be because it, maybe the crossing is like what Rex's little, you know, group is called, and they're going to link up with the path from from the Kenobi show. Maybe that maybe that has something to do with it. Um, retrieval that could that could mean a number of things since the Bad Batch and what they do is a lot of retrievals metamorphosis i mean that just means someone's maybe that's going to be a, a a crosshair episode and he's finally going to see the light and change you know since that's what metaphor metamorphosis means the outpost that could be anything pabu that could be anything tipping point obviously that means something's changing but you know it's like or we're, you know things are coming to a head but who knows what that means and then the summit and plan 99 so i mean again, again it's like is the summit an actual summit of a mountain is it's like, I, I don't know there's 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 the episode titles are not really helping with you know guessing where this where the show is going and i like the fact that you know it's really keeping us guessing on our toes who knows where it's going to go so eager for it to continue and before it's over mando will be back yay so so yeah that'll be it for this review uh thank you for watching remember to like comment subscribe all that great stuff remember to follow me on twitter instagram those links are in the description below and i'll see you guys next time thank you so much for watching and goodbye